So my guest today is, of course, um, Tim Lowe, a distinguished biologist on the page and in the field, who's actually studied mammals, reptiles, frogs, fish, and plants. And in the 1970s, he contributed to the, to the discovery of one of my favorite creatures, um, a new leaf-tailed gecko. But today we are here to talk about his riveting new book, Where Song Began. Um, Tim, I suppose I'd like to start by finding out from you how you first became interested in Australian birds, given that you had already studied so many other creatures. I... not sure. Make <laughs> not something a good start, up! <laughs> is it? Give answers for an hour, I can't answer your first question. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I've always been interested in the whole mix of nature. I, I, I think it probably goes back to my mother in very early childhood, you know, when you're a little toddler and your mother says, look at that, a birdie. And I think that things that could move, but they couldn't talk, that essential mystery of life, you know, a baby comes out of a mother's womb, new life, that's inherently mysterious. We die, that's a mystery. But there are these, all these other things that are alive but we can't talk to them. Like, you know, what are they thinking? What are they doing? I and mean, I think that's endlessly mysterious. Uh, but I think that my motives as a writer are partly very much the sense that, I mean, we see animals are, are beautiful, trees are beautiful, but for most people, their appreciation of that's fairly shallow. And for mine, it's so deep, you know, like it's motivating my whole life. I'm thinking, why can't, why isn't everybody spending all their time looking at the birds and the plants? And so as a writer, I'm motivated to do that. And with the bird book, I think it was largely a quite prosaic decision that birds are the animals that people find most easy to relate to. Mm -hmm. So a book about birds is going to connect with more people than a book about leaf-tailed geckos. <laughs> Possibly, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's interesting that you say that, you know, these are the creatures that it's easiest for us to connect to because they're in our everyday lives. They're above us right now, in fact, contributing to this conversation in their own way. But you say that they are also the most neglected animals in terms of the way we, we value, if you like, the animal kingdom of Australia, that, that they've really suffered at the expense of our interest, our fascination with mammals. Yeah, I mean, certainly wouldn't say they're the most neglected animals. I mean, invertebrates are really far more neglected. And it's one of the things where people who are really into invertebrates the most, they'll have a go at people like me and say, why don't you write more about invertebrates? You know, why are you picking on the cute and furry things? I'll say, look, I, I know where you're coming from, but you want to connect to a large number of people. If you write a lot about millipedes and nematodes, people <laughs> start to nod off. And, but I, you know, where the story is good, like in previous books, The New Nature and Feral Future, I had a lot of invertebrates and had, we had a ladybird on the cover of, um, of my last book. So, but yes, I, I, I certainly don't think they are neglected. But what, what you really mean is that I think that in terms of telling the narrative stories about Australia as a land with unique wildlife, that it's been overwhelming the marsupials that have carried that story. And that what I say in the introduction of the bird book is that you can actually, I think, understand Australia's place better biologically by looking at the birds. Mm -hmm. And that one of the reviewers said, well, that's a really tall order to make that claim but having read the book I'm inclined to agree okay so maybe you'd like to expand a little bit on why that is why that theory is that is the sort of spine of the book yeah well I, mean, I suppose um, we've I suppose there's really two strong themes running through the book one is that we've got a very distinctive singular bird fauna so if you forget about Antarctica which hardly has any birds we have got the most unusual singular distinctive bird fauna and that reflects our isolation so you know we are isolated Australia breaks away from Antarctica it's only when it started getting closer to Asia that a lot of birds were coming in well when I say only just we're probably talking about 30 million years ago so you know, a fair bit back but yeah they're bubbling and brewing away and going off in their own directions. But not only that, they then start colonising the rest of the world. I mean, we Australia was the most important continent on Earth for bird evolution. We gave more birds than we received. And I mean, that was the thing that, when I actually started writing this book, I didn't know that. I mean, it's like this amazing punchline that the DNA work, it was coming out and it was, it was indicating an important role for Australia as an exporter of songbirds. But the first evidence produced by Australians in the 1980s, they had difficulty getting it published, it took them four years to get that research published. And it was totally 
totally ignored and it was only uh, when Americans started doing genetic research and it was all pointing back to songbirds having come out of Australia so being able to say that in, a, in an English wood, the nightingales, the robins, the larks all came out of Australia. Not, not as nightingales, but there, there was an ancestral bird that came out of Australia and gave rise to every bird that could sing. You think, oh my God, I can say that in a book, you know. <laughs> but why was there a cultural cringe around you making that claim? Oh, well, I think we all know the answer to that, that a you know, terra nullius, the explorers come to Australia, the people are considered primitive, the wildlife seems to be wacky, it's stupid, it's strange. It's just the sense that uh, the to that, that old phrase, the topsy-turvy land down under, that Australia was the place where God had put his early creations, things that didn't work very well, you know, the platypus, you know, part bird, part mammal. So he'd been ex experimenting early on, and Australia was like the closet where all these shows all these things that weren't very good <laughs> and and then if you look at colonial history we introduce foxes and they start wiping out the marsupials so you've got the early naturalists saying this is evidence that European creatures are far superior to the creatures uh, in Australia the weeds start taking over so you, you had all these all these narratives that fitted and so yeah when that research is coming showing that Australia was very important I mean it was even Charles Darwin was saying that large land masses tend to produce superior creations just because you've got more species over a larger area evolving to a higher degree. And I mean, interesting thing about Charles Darwin, I mean, you know, he's writing very early in time, but so much of what he's written has stood up that people like myself, well, you know, we don't want to knock Darwin. I mean, mm. he was so good. I think it was the amount of time they spent in the field that years and years travelling around the world on the Beagle. A, 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 an academic biologist today gets very little time in the field by comparison, and that is why it is very difficult for biologists today to match the output of people like Darwin, Wallace, Bates, who were spending years, years travelling. You mentioned before, um, in passing, their nightingales and thrushes, and one of the lovely details in your book is about the early colonial settlers bringing birds out with them so that they could listen to what they considered the sort of pleasing songs of home, as opposed to the raucous shrieks of the local birds. We're going to come to the raucous shrieking in a moment, but just tell us about the fate of those early colonial birds that came here. Well, there's plenty of blackbirds around Adelaide. Song larks outside. Um, yeah, I, it, that, people have got that. People often characterise the acclimatisation movement correctly. So it's really big. This idea that God had put animals and plants in different parts of the earth, and it was part of mankind's duty to actually redistribute them to the greatest benefit. And so there were two strands here. One was. Europeanising Australia, so song larks and nightingales. So, so I think it was four nightingales were, were let go in the Melbourne Botanic Gardens, and they lasted a few months. So, the calls of the nightingale, which are greatly inferior to those of the lyrebird. I mean, I mean they're a beautiful call, a beautiful calling bird. But you know, you can go online on <clears throat> YouTube and play a nightingale and think, oh, that's really good, and then switch to a lyrebird. And then it's like the, the, the nightingale was just the warm-up act, you know. <laughs> the the, the live bird's just so good. But yeah, so you had all those birds. But the, the animals they wanted to bring out, they inclu you know, included like zebras and monkeys. So there was talk about bringing, introducing monkeys into Victoria to entertain um, travellers and boa constrictors to eat up the poison snakes. So there was a, a really bizarre, totally internationalised element to it as well. But that's, that's another book. That's another book, but um, just you, you mentioning the sort of comparison there between the sort of musical abilities of the, um, of the nightingale and the lyrebird. Are you good at bird calls? I used to be until my teeth started going crooked. I can't even whistle now, so let's not go oh, there. Oh, <laughs> what a shame. I was so hoping you might give us a demonstration. OK, well, moving right along, let's talk a little bit about this raucous shrieking. Maybe you can do some raucous shrieking. Um, you, you say that this, this sound that is unique to Australia is to do with soil and with the abundance of food and what the birds are eating that provokes the sound that, that we hear. So tell us a little bit about how this equation works. Okay, this is, it's quite a long equation. A plus B equals C, D, E, F. So I'll, I'll try and do it very, very quickly. So the soil here is very, very infertile. We're not on tectonic boundaries, very little volcanic activity. And the soil is highly structured. 
the number of eucalypt species around Sydney is far greater than the number of tree species in England. So they've evolved, a lot of the trees have evolved, evolved to particular patches of soil and that as the ice ages have come and gone, the climate has swung, but we haven't had the mobility of trees that you had in the Northern Hemisphere where the glaciers moved, they ground up the landscape, they pushed soil over large areas. When they retreated, trees traveled huge distances, carried their seeds carried by um, jays and squirrels and so forth. Here we didn't have the glaciers, we did have the trees staying in one place through the glacial swings and the way that the plants could adapt to climate change or long term and cyclical was I, I believe through a very heavy investment in pollination and, and often it was birds as pollinators so it, wherever you get the best wildflowers in the world it's where the soil is very very infertile and that's attributed to a number of things. One is a poverty of, of actual insects but um, I think it also means that the plants can hunker down, they can adapt to one patch of soil, they don't move anywhere, but when the climate is changing, if they have these massive floral displays and birds are brought to their flowers carrying large amounts of pollen large distances, I mean, the, the best thing for a eucalypt today in a hotter, dry climate would be if some of these lorikeets or migrating honey eaters or flying foxes bring pollen from much further north and west from a hotter, dry climate, then you get this mass just uh, dropped off seeds by the eucalypts and that one seedling that the pollen has come from 200 kilometres away, that's going to be best adapted to a hotter, drier climate. So, so the birds are as loud as they are. Ah, OK, I left a bit out, thank <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, crucially. <laughs> just as well, it's not just me here talking, isn't it? <laughs> I could see people going, <laughs> that didn't quite make sense. <laughs> thank you. OK, so, so the plants... Uh, the plants benefit greatly from bird pollination. There is more bird pollination in Australia than anywhere else. The, bird, the nectar feeding birds are much bigger. They're gigantic. So if you look at Africa's biggest nectar feeding bird, the Cape sugar bird, I mean, if you chop off its tail, it's only about that big, smaller than New Holland honey eater. Uh, uh, the biggest hummingbird in Latin America, gi giant hummingbird, tiny, you know, we've got these gigantic birds, huge numbers of them. If you look at nectar, it is the most defendable food resource available to birds so that if you eat a fruit, it's, it's not there anymore. If you eat an insect, a seed, it's gone. Uh, but, but flowers, they keep producing nectar, a flowering eucalypt tree or Banksia grevillea, that is just a sugar source. It's just a larder of food. You don't need any talent to find it. If you are going to grow fat on that resource, the talent you need is to be able to command it by driving off other birds. So nectar birds are extremely aggressive. And this is true, as true of hummingbirds as it is of our honey eaters. But because hummingbirds are tiny, their aggression doesn't mean much. When you have really big nectar feeding birds, in very large numbers, they're attacking any small bird that comes near them, whether it's after nectar or not. Then we have all these other sweet foods like nectar, uh, like lerp, honeydew, manna. These are also defended by honey eaters, and it, honey eaters can be the dominant birds in a forest. And that that aggression, as as a, there's got to be a bird. Hands up, who's a bird watcher here? Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of places in Australia, you know, you, know, you think, oh, this, this bit of bush looks nice. Let's see if there's birds here. You pull up in the car, you hear noisy miners, you go, uh-uh, you just drive on mm. because you know that, that extremely aggressive honey, it means that the bird watching is going to be poor because they've driven everything else out. So basically what you're saying is that Australian birds are on a kind of massive sugar high and that's sort of making them sort of hyper. Actually... <laughs> No. Oh. <laughs> That's not what you're saying. <laughs> when, when I was writing, I really, I really looked into that research. So this is, you know, like it's, writing a book is non-fiction, it's still storytelling, you know, you've got to entertain. I thought, if I can say that, you know, we give our kids a lot of sugar and they're buzzing around for hours and so the birds are all high on sugar, da 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 But I looked into the medical research and there's no evidence that feeding kids sugar makes them hyperactive and so I, did, I didn't go there. Yes, you say something really interesting in passing in the book about how animals do not get addicted to food, that this is a complete myth. So. You're yeah, that was talk talking about the uh, like feeding, feeding them bread and so on. Yes, because I want to come to us feeding birds later on if we've got time. So, so sugar is not an ad an addiction f for animals. That's what you're saying. Oh, well, I don't think anyone's done the research on animals, but it, it's not on people. So I assume it's not not on animals. But well, I mean, it's very it's very quick to digest. So I think that one reason why honey eaters 
can be very aggressive is that you know that you'll see them go to a bank so yeah, and I mean it's so it's so you know quicker to digest than starch or protein or fat based foods so I think that you know like you know you get back from bushwalking and you, you have something very sweet your energy levels return quickly so I think I think that's going on but um, you mentioned in passing amongst the other foodstuffs there's something called lerp and you do hmm. devote quite a lot of time to lerp I had never heard of this word before which reveals my ignorance tell us about what lerp is I mean it's good to be talking about lerp in Adelaide because as I say in chapter two the star of that chapter is David Payton who's the best known uh, ornithologist in in South Australia and very art conservation as someone who who has you know, rightfully earned a lot of respect from the natural history community but he was as a young um, postgraduate doing research on honey eaters and it was always believed that you often see honey eaters in leaves and they get a lot of insects when they're feeding their chicks they they're giving them protein from insects and so it was assumed that when they were in foliage that it was just insects they were getting but he's, he was noticing that it was often was lerp so lerp these tiny little bugs like r vaguely related to aphids they're sucking the sap but they they get they suck in more sap than they need and the sugars they make a, they make a little cone that they hide and like a limpet so it's very similar to limpet you've got a tiny insect under that but this limpet is a mixture of starch and sugar and the birds will live off that they love it and so you have all these birds eating this lerp and aboriginal people ate it so it just you don't have to go far from adelaide into the Mallee country so brook it was brook, brookfield brookfield reserve that place where the hairy nosed wombats i've been in there when there was a lerp outbreak and you get the lumps of it on the leaves and you can just run it through your leaves and through your teeth i mean your teeth i've gone there via uh, yeah <laughs> thank you Gee, i need you Carol. <laughs> Yes, I'd been there, stopped at a cake shop and he ate this dried cake and then I'm out there eating the lerp thinking, this is much better than morning tea. <laughs> and so there are two descriptions from over 100 years ago of Aboriginal people going into the Mallee lands when the lerp was outbreaking mm -hmm. and coming out looking sleek and shiny. I mean, it's not a way to describe people, but, you know, the, the, you know clearly that they just... Nutritionally. Like you could, they were putting on weight from these lerp outbreaks. And I talked to a... I contacted biologists just by you know, emailing. You know, have you ever seen these lerp outbreaks? Because um, until I did that trip to Brookfield, I hadn't seen it. And I got it was Joe Benchamesh in Victoria studying um, uh, Mallee fowl, and he'd, he'd seen the lerp that had fallen off the trees, and it was like drifts of snow on the ground. And he's following around a tame Mallee fowl, and it's just peck, 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 eating this snow. And so the capacity, I mean, you think of Australia as a boom bust environment mm. and that when birds breed, there's got to be an abundance of food. You know, like if birds like honey eater can turn up when a tree, a whole forest just begins to flower, if they start nesting, then there's a good chance that that sugar, that sugar supply will get them through the breeding season. Similarly, if there's a lerp outbreak, you can imagine all the birds are just breeding. Mm. It's a whole big generational mm. thing. So these sort of boom bust events with lerp, with nectar, because I mean, as many people here would know with eucalypts, they're nothing like European trees where you can say, okay, spring, eucalypts flowering, that in actual fact, big flowering events can be five years apart. They can be 10 years apart, complex relationships with rainfall. But this boom bust land that is a Australia means that you do get these big events and that they can totally change ecosystems over large areas because the honey eaters are breed up in one where there's one valley of flowering eucalypts they can then be moving off hundreds of kilometers and they're eating lerp and insects in a different state and so it goes and one of the things that um, I'm going to sort of graze across the book because there's so much material in this it's such a rich rich collection of um, research and and storytelling um so we're just going to kind of give you a sense this morning of some of the the subjects that tim addresses so i want to talk a little bit about territoriality because one of the birds that you kind of destroyed an illusion for me uh about in terms of territoriality was that that lovely chiming tinkling sound of the bellbird has a far more sinister kind of um, meaning than yes. I had ever appreciated. So tell us about why we should not be quite so charmed by the sound of the bellbird. Yeah, it's interesting. So you have all the poetry about the beauty of the bellbird calls, but bellbirds are closely related to noisy miners, equally aggressive, totally commanding the resources. They're living off the lerp as their staple food. 
but so they like and so there's a comparison of them to farmers that they are farming lerp and the reason this farming analogy is turned up in the scientific literature it's been accepted as a legitimate noun to use is that they will take the cap off the lerp off in the time they've been seeing the curl the bill and someone goes and looks at the leaf well probably with binoculars but that the insect is still there and then it can then build another lerp in a day or so and so that that is equivalent to milking the cow that you're taking away its production but not harming the producer of your food resource so they're farmers but the analogy to farming i, mean, I hope there's no farmers here it, it it goes a bit further than that because they are they're not farming sustainably so over time eventually these bell minor colonies the number of lerp insects builds up to the point that the trees start dying yes and I read about this a long time ago, and I often drive through Cunningham's Gap. I'm from Brisbane, drive through Cunningham's Gap, and there's a long bellbird colony, you've got the sign, the lookout, and there were no, no dead trees. So I thought, well, you know, I, I don't question this is happening in some places, but one problem we have in Australia is that the extrapolation of research. So there's not a lot of biologists, there's a lot of biology, and so someone will do a study of one bird in one valley, and then people say, oh yeah, that applies everywhere. And so I thought, well, maybe this bellbird thing isn't everywhere, but now when I drive up Cunningham's Gap there are hundreds of dead trees so so yeah the the, the the number of bugs has just built up so many you can hear the bellbirds they're still there tinkling away um, but yeah the the when the trees are really stressed they often drop their leaves and flush new leaves and these get really heavily attacked they've got sweet sap in them and so it goes and so um, one of the interesting things that goes on in Eastern Australia is that real estate agents will promote blocks of bush with bellbirds on it but what they're actually Actually selling is is hey here's your forest well, the trees are going to die but you know <laughs> <laughs> let's talk a little bit about other forms of aggression I suppose the one that that we are almost familiar with in a kind of urban and suburban context is the magpie attack mm. um, and and you make a point which I think is really interesting about how tolerant we are of these attacks and you cite an example where a boy was blinded yeah, I think Toowoomba um, in Toowoomba, and uh, the bird was relocated. So when you hear of an animal like a lion attacking someone in a zoo, they're put down immediately with no questions asked, and yet this bird was just put somewhere else. And now magpies have modified their behavior, and they've started going for ears as opposed to eyes. So what's going on there? No one's yet worked out a way to interview magpies. So. <laughs> <laughs> Smart answer. <laughs> I get asked to interpret birds all the time. Well, I get yes. sick of it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tell us about magpies anyway. <laughs> Actually, I think I think it's more interesting to talk about the the human bird relationships. That's one of the things yeah. I say in the book. That I think I think it's it's stronger here than anywhere else in the world. That that yeah, this this tolerance we have, and that I think I don't think most Australians realise what is going on in cassowary country in North Queensland. That in places like Mission Beach, that it was I was writing a story for Australian Geographic after the cyclone. And there was a story in the Australian newspaper about how cassowaries after the cyclone were going into backyards mm. to get food and so I talked the magazine into flying me up and I found out yes this cassowary is going into backyards but they've been doing it for years I mean the story was a complete beat up but to me the real story is that you know I spoke to residents in North Queensland so oh, we don't build backyards we want we want the cassowaries coming through so here's a bird that it's only caused one death in Australia. A, a boy was slashed in the throat, bled to death. But there was a man who was kicked and the, 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 the nail went, the, the toenail went into very close to his heart. So these are seriously dangerous birds. You have a lot of legs broken, hospitalizations from cassowaries, stories of cassowaries waiting at the school bus and the kids are too frightened to get off. <laughs> You had National Park trail signs closed, you know, danger cassowaries, do not enter. <laughs> um, but, you know, despite all this going on, people say, oh, yeah, that's just the other birds. Our birds are OK. You know? <laughs> and so, you know, they're coming through, they're plucking the cherry tomatoes, they're eating the, the food out of the pet bowls. 
people who feed them, they'll, they'll kick on the doors. They'll tap on the windows. You know, people just say we're sitting in the lounge room and there's this big <laughs> head looking in through the window. And so I went out with a National Parks Ranger dealing with a complaint. And so here's a woman, she's moved up from Southern Australia and we're sitting in her lounge room and it just, she just didn't look right for North Queensland. I mean, it's all sort of plush carpet and there's a little tick-tock clock and she's sitting there with a little fluffy poodly dog and <laughs> plush carpet. And she's not afraid to go outside because there's these giant two metre high birds outside. <laughs> and she's, and the, and the National Parks Ranger saying, well, they, they probably won't kill you, but yeah, I wouldn't let that dog go outside. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, we go three houses down and there's this really old unpainted house there and there's this elderly couple and they, they've got the, you know, there's the cassowaries up the back lurking in the shrubbery waiting for feed. So when he's not feeding them, they're just going down to her yard and sort of leaning over, you know. And I mean, these are birds that have killed people. Yes. And now this National Park Ranger, he could have fined that man for feeding them because it is, it is illegal. But, you know, you've got to live fit in with the community. Uh, but, but, you know, he, he was saying that <clears throat> the, he had a pawpaw tree and he's looking forward to a pawpaw, but he just sees the cat who went, go up and thump, kick the tree. <laughs> pawpaw falls down and he loses it. <laughs> but, I, yeah, that, that level of toleration, I think, is, is truly, truly amazing. And it, it actually has its bad side because after cyclones, people put out fruit on the side of the roads and they become you know, you associate roads with food, get hit and so on. So yeah. that, those relationships are very problematical. But, you know, to think we're a country where we've got the second biggest bird in the world by weight, cassowaries are heavier than emus. So you've got these massively, you know, giant birds in people's backyards, not not right out in the middle of suburbia, although I did hear about a little one that went right through the middle of Innisfail, right through a country town, uh, right, and then across to um, Magpies where, they are blinding children mm. and yet they win popularity polls. I mean, Australia is a country where our most popular bird is a bird that blinds children. <laughs> Let's just stay with the, um, the feeding the birds for a, for a moment longer uh, because you do um, quote some research that's been done where um, uh, people answered a survey, I think it was Birds Australia that put this out, saying that one of the reasons that they fed birds was that they felt guilty for the destruction of habitat and they felt that in a way by putting seed out in their gardens, and I would, I would probably be guilty of this myself, that they were in a sense giving back to the birds, that this was by way of an apology and saying, look, I'm really sorry that your normal food isn't here, so let me put some seed out for you. So can you just talk a little bit about us feeding birds and what we're actually doing when we do that. Yeah, I think, you know, I talked about how uh, to command a resource like nectar, aggression is the most vital attribute. Uh, if you think about a bird feeder in a backyard, once again, aggression is the most vital attribute. You don't need to be very clever to identify uh, a tray full of food. If you think of seagulls on the beach, mm. that all that fighting, you know, you throw a whole pile of chips you don't need to be very clever to be a seagull. If you're a bully, you'll be successful. So that if you look at the birds that come to feeders, they're much larger than the average bird size. They do tend to be large, aggressive birds. So actually exacerbating what has become a quite significant conservation problem in Australia. So I thank you for asking this question, Caroline, which is that the big, we are benef tending to benefit big aggressive birds. Not always, I mean, Regent honey eaters, extremely mm. aggressive honey eater that is now endangered. Mm. But um, by feeding birds, I, I think there are two things that I, I suppose I can, yes, I'll say I dislike about it. I dislike about it. One is that, that if you're feeding currawongs, magpies, uh, butcher birds, these will turn on the smaller birds, so you, you're exacerbating that big bird benefiting, small bird not benefiting. But also I think that atoning for guilt thing is terrible. You know, we do have environmental crises and it's, Australians should help. The idea that you can help by putting out food in your backyard, that's a very selfish cop-out and I, I really try and 
in two books I've done that say you have no right to think they do something real. You know, you don't you don't get out of it that easy. <laughs> OK, we've all been warned this morning. Mm. Um, let's turn to the subject of mimicry, because some of the loveliest parts of this book are about um, lyre birds. And I suppose because that's a bird that's local to where I live, I particularly love reading about it. So can you just talk a little bit about um, why the lyre bird has this extraordinary ability to mimic, what, what's the purpose of it exactly? Oh, it's, it's about showing male fitness and presu presumably intelligence. So um, most, pretty well any, any bird where there's like a peacock's tail, a bird of paradise, or in, well, not all birds, but, but certainly in the case of the lyre bird, yeah, they're promiscuous. So the, the males that are best, they'll spend most of the day in the breeding season calling. The females are listening to all the males and by choosing the male with the best song, that is their best way of ensuring that they have a, a very intelligent, skillful offspring. You know, they're getting, they're getting the best genes. So. It's interesting that you use the word intelligence there, because of course there is that expression bird brain, um, and you, you give us the origin of that expression. Why have we been so convinced for so long that birds are stupid? Well, I think partly it's vanity, the assumption that the, the, the sort of tree of life where you have, you have slime amoebas and then you get slime moles and then they evolve into fish which evolve into frogs and eventually you get mammals at the top, primates are at the top of the mammals and apes above them and humans and so birds are put below in between mammals and reptiles. And now the other, the other one reason why that thinking was allowed to last so long was that when it was worked out where intelligence resides in the brains of mammals, the birds don't, uh, I don't know the terminology of the bird brains and mammal brains, but birds don't have that or they have it very reduced size. So it was realised quite late that bird intelligence resides in a different part of the brain from mammal intelligence. So anatomical studies match that kind of tree of life thing. I mean, so, so it would be an insult to humans to have said that some birds are more intelligent than than some than monkeys, um, uh -huh. but, and so people just didn't do the research. You know, they, there's just the automatic assumption. But there, when the research was done, it, I mean, it, it, I think it's really interesting to realise that humans and birds. I mean, you, you can have a really strong relationship with an intelligent parrot. You know, you can be looking at it, talking at it, feeling really strong affection. But I mean, that the evolutionary distance between us and them, it's over 300 billion years. So you've got to go back 300 million years to find a common ancestor between birds and mammals. It's an unbelievably long period of evolutionary separation. And the interesting thing is that if you look at mammalian intelligence, it's quite recent. If you look at uh, like the lo very large parrots like keas, grey parrots in Africa, no one's done research on our biggest cockatoos. They're not kept much in captivity. So the ones we should be looking at are palm cockatoos and our black cockatoos. The kind of research that's been done in the US on grey parrots, it hasn't been done on our big, big smart parrots. So if you look at the fossil evidence for, for keas, kia ancestors, they, you can go back, I think it's in New Zealand, something like 18 or 20 million years, you've got fossils of large parrots, you've got old cockatoos. If you look at in mammalian intelligence, primates are much younger. Mm. And so it's almost certainly the case that if you were on an alien spaceship coming to Australia 20 million years ago, looking for intelligent life forms, the best place to go would have been into an Australian rainforest and talking to the parrots. Yeah, and but the then they would have birds. left once they saw the cassowaries, they would have left. <laughs> that, that, that would have scared them off. They would have gone back to their planet. Um, but you do say that some parrots and songbirds outdo apes, dolphins and even elephants on some tasks. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that's probably me being a little bit deceptive. I wouldn't suggest that birds are, well, I think, well, yeah, I mean, I think some ways they are more intelligent than those other animals. I mean, what we find is that you can only test intelligence with certain tests and that there are some where birds do better and some where mammals do better. So in terms of mirror recognition, birds are really bad at that. And so, uh, and, and play, I mean, it's a really interesting thing that, uh, Kangaroos, you know, young kangaroos will play, but kangaroos are not very bright mammals. I mean, you know, lo lots of birds in a picnic ground looking down on kangaroos have more intelligence than kangaroos do. Uh, but 
but young kangaroos play, whereas play is very, very rare in birds, and all the birds that do play are highly intelligent, like, like magpies and, and some of the parrots. But yeah, so it, it's a bit of a mix and match thing. But I mean, I, I don't really want to say that the most intelligent birds are more intelligent than the most intelligent mammals, more that they are kind of on a... On they're both very good in some ways. Let's yeah. just go back to the lyrebird then for a moment. Um, you say that baby lyrebirds start calling while they're still inside the egg. Mm. That's remarkable. Yeah, it is. And, the, and that when they, there's a large chick in the nest, I mean, I haven't, this is not my own experience, I haven't <laughs> ever walked up to a lyrebird's nest, but they can scream so loud that it's, it's hard to get to the nest. So people are trying, you know, they're trying to walk up to a lyrebird's <laughs> nest and they can barely do it because of the sound, but that acoustic power. But yeah, I think it's amazing. I mean, I don't know if you'll ask this as a question, so I'll throw it in, but that, you know, if you think back in terms of the evolutionary tree, that to have uh, lyrebirds and scrub birds as the first branch when you draw your phylogenetic tree of songbirds, the implication is that those two lineages are the closest we've got to the very first songbirds they were that they were and they've got the widest repertoires mm. and, and all birds that have all lineages are younger have much a narrower range of calls but what i assume happened and it was actually les christidis at the australian museum who gave me this idea was that when when these very first songbirds evolved in australia that the birds they were competing with would have been like cuckoos parrots kingfishers well, probably no kingfishers in Australia then, but quite narrow repertoires. And here they've developed these really flexible throats and that they just went for it. They were just liberated. They were just calling all over the place, all these amazing sounds. And that as songbirds evolved into multiple species, you couldn't have that as a system because you just have acoustic confusion. Mm. If you're using calls to to show off, to attract mates, to travel around in groups, you need to really allocate the bandwidth. It's sort of like as you get more and more radio stations, governments have got to give them bandwidth <laughs> so that they can operate in that Basically, the birds had to sort that out for themselves. And now, of course, we get the phenomenon with um, urban birds um, um, becoming louder to overcome the sound of traffic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's right. Birds are responding to us all the time. And that whole idea that you can draw a line and say, nature on this side, humanity on this side, and that nature wants to be natural. I mean, it was my, I'm sorry, as I mentioned my previous book, New Nature, it's out of print, but Penguin, I do want to bring it back into print. But yeah, I mean, I went into all those issues there that animals will so readily exploit humans that you can go back to when you had the first white settlement in Sydney, when the convicts are growing grain, they were just getting hit straight away by king parrots Ros and rosellas were coming and raiding the very, you know, the very, very first crops being grown in Australia. There were birds attacking those crops. Um, you got really early descriptions of swallows learning to build their mud nests on the little, the little cottages that early settlers were building in the farmland around Sydney. So, you know, s swallows, it's really hard to find a swallow nest now that is not on a building or a bridge or some mm. human structure. Well, they started doing that straight away. And it's not that they ran out of natural nest places, that capacity of animals to go, oh, this looks good, I'll try this. You know, we, we tend to underestimate that because we have this ethos that says that nature wants to be natural, it doesn't like being near us. And that I think, you know, that these birds flying around here, you can't say for sure, you, you could argue that these birds have been pushed into the city, they could, you know, there could be young birds that were pushed out. But when you do research on urban birds or mammals, you tend to find that they achieve higher densities in urban cities, often that the clutches are larger and so on. So there is a huge amount of evidence for a lot of species that uh, urban environments are highly favourable for them. So I think, you know, I think we should accept that that mm. is what animals can be like. How do lyrebirds save lives? It's not actually in my book, but you looked at my website or something. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of research. It was the first big thing that came out. I thought, ah, oh, damn, it's a book. If they'd just published a little bit earlier. Yes, yeah, so there's research around um, Melbourne, of course, where you had those tragic bushfires. And so uh, lyrebirds at capacity scratch up the undergrowth to get um, grubs, insects in the soil, means that they are reducing ground cover plants. Uh, so you've got less bracken, less long grass where you've got feeding lyrebirds. So the bushfire 
uh, trying to move across the gully, it gets all this area where the soil's been churned up and a fire can't travel. So um, it's a fire break. And so what it looks like around Melbourne is that lyrebirds save human lives by reducing bushfire risk and that foxes by preying on lyrebirds mm. are increasing bushfire risk. So if you want to reduce your bushfire risk around Melbourne, kill your foxes and save your lyrebirds. I mean, it's, it's beautiful <laughs> ecological <laughs> stories. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one more thing about lyrebirds and then I promise to move on. But um, there's the fascinating information in the book about human exploitation of birds in terms of the birds that we used to eat, for example, and the plumage trade and, and all sorts of things that we've sold. Mm. And you mentioned that there was a time when lyrebird tails were for sale from stalls in Sydney streets. Mm. What, what was that about? Who was doing that? Well, e e everyone here who has been a bird watcher for a long time will know that the plumage trade was really big in the 19th century so that women would wear uh, in their hats would have bird of paradise mm. plumes egret plumes osprey wings sometimes even bits of seagulls if i assume these are the less well off <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the so the plumage trade was big and lyrebirds had the best most spectacular plumes of any birds in Australia. So they were they were parlour ornaments. They were uh, mm. they were put on walls. They were put on vases around tables. And so when you read, I mean, the bird societies in Australia, as as around the world, have a long and proud tradition of bird conservation. And so the early early target of protection was trying to end that plumage trade and so you have these old articles that you can read about in emu the the, the bird journal about the hawkers wandering around sydney streets with baskets of 50 lyrebird tails in them and and then the the um, auctions in london and paris where they're selling bird of paradise including queensland rifle birds <clears throat> and once again bird of paradise mm. Mm. So with the oh, terrible oh, yeah. stories of extinction that we hear every day, is there a story, a good news story, that you can give us about us retrieving a bird species from the brink of extinction here in Australia? Is there, is there a story where something, something has been saved recently? I'm thinking about the night parrot, I'm thinking about the um, regent honey eater, I'm thinking about, not the regent honey eater, but there's a, there's a bird in the Capertee Valley that's very... That's the regent honey That is the regent honey eater, yes. So is there a bird that we're just on the brink of saving or that we have just pulled back from the brink? My mind's a complete blank. Can anyone help me? <laughs> Maybe not. No, orange belly parrot's just about to fall over, yes. so that's looking really bad. Um, I think region honey, it's looking a little bit better, but it'll be a really long time before they turn around. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of looking for good news, I mean, I think the good news is there. It's very much a, a picture of winners and losers. And I mean, I have talked about the winners, but, you know, like Adelaide's a really birdy city. And I think that, I think that as a conservationist, you, you have to feel concerned about the, the problem birds and that, that the issues are incredibly serious, but you also, you've got to fortify yourself and feel good to live to live life well. I mean, I, I, you know, I refuse to be unhappy on behalf of the birds that are doing badly. I mean, I write about them doing badly. But in fact, in this book, I, I was originally going to have a chapter on conservation, but I, I ran out of room. It would have been too long. But in a sense, I'm glad I didn't because I think that, uh, it's more important just to connect people to nature and that if they're connected and they join a society and they realise uh, that there are birds in trouble. But I think that one of the, the problems with conservation in Australia today is that, you know, we, have, we are a land of parrots, a land of large songbirds, and these two groups, they're so good at living among people mm. that it is quite understandable that a lot of people who don't have a lot of education do not believe that there is a problem with bird conservation. Because they what problem? There's problems everywhere. I drive, drive around my farm, there's rosellas and all the bloody corellas are a damn mm. nuisance. And you know, people think there are too many flying foxes. They think there are more corellas than ever before. And that these are animals adapting to human resources, but that this is not uh, truly indicative of 
the, the overall situation in Australia and that, that makes it hard for the conservation message to get through mm. and that I think conservationists need to readily acknowledge, oh yeah, yeah, there's some birds doing amazingly well, but that, you know, a yes, but is better than just trying to say, oh, it's bleak out there. How can you say it's bleak out there when we can just hear native birds all around us? Yeah. What do you think about um, avi tourism, as it's called? I mean, there's quite a, a push in, in a few sort of um, uh, nature magazines that sort of offer, you know, trips to Borneo and places in South America to view very exotic birds. Are you a supporter of the idea of tourism for bird watchers, bird lovers? I mean, I do in so much as I'm a, a guide on the Christmas Island Bird and Nature Week each year. Um, th there's, the ethical problem is the carbon footprint that people flying around the world uh, for uh, you know, 10 days of bird watching that they're consuming a lot of resources to do that. So mm. I, I think it, it is it, ethically it is deeply problematical the, the travel footprint. So that's, that's it is with all travel. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that there are questions from the audience. So if you'd like to ask um, Tim a question, make your way to the microphone in the central aisle. And um, we'll um, we'll take some questions as they're long as they're not about individual magpies that you have observed in your garden. Mm. <laughs> um, yes. Hi, um, I'm Sandra, and I live in Mafra in, in Victoria, in Gippsland, about 200 kilometres east of Melbourne, and we have an enormous amount of uh, large birds in our town. And my question is about um, some of the things that happen when these birds move into towns. For example, we have a lot of king parrots, gorgeous birds to look at, but they largely live on acorns. And we also have, um, of course, a lot of birds that live on our fruit trees too. And I'm just wondering in terms of whether or not and they do, and, and I'm sure they do actually, it has caused problems for the smaller birds because people do comment on the fact that the smaller birds are decreasing in number. But I do also wonder about the question, it has been suggested that maybe the um, king parrots eating the acorns, that that possibly is toxic for them. Are there problems like that with the birds moving into what has been a created European uh, environment? The main research a researcher in this area is Daryl Jones in Brisbane. He has looked at um, the feeding of bread to uh, the white ibis. So there's a lot of that going on in Brisbane as there is in many parts of Australia. And he found that they were being very sensible about it, that they weren't taking much bread back to the, um, to the nest. And that if you looked at you could always go and there's people throwing out chips and bread and lots of birds flying around but if you followed an individual bird around it wasn't actually eating much of that junk food and that the diet was actually quite good so he came out of this with quite a, an optimistic message uh, with um, magpies they have been found with high cholesterol levels from eating a lot of processed meat so those are the bits of research that, that we have I think that with um, I mean you, you, what you're saying about toxic acorns there's a lot of talk in northern New South Wales with um, camphor laurels where mm. you know the camphor in the leaves is highly toxic therefore it's not a good idea if the birds eat camphor laurel berries well that's what people say but the the camphor laurel as, as these trees are just taking over the landscape everywhere from Belgium up into southern Queensland and clearly it is not bad for the birds because there's a seeds that have been excreted out of them so I think I, I would assume that birds are generally very good at deciding what is good for them and that the limited research we've got would indicate that uh, the foods we're feeding them are not are not harmful but that is very limited research so that those are just scraps of information that's all i can give you thank you hello my name is nedra i live in north sydney and I overlook a rooftop garden quite a large one um, filled with lemons figs you know garden flowers and uh, observed a couple of years back an absolute surge of white soft-crested cockatoos came down and they stripped 
the garden and they got so excited by it seemed to be what they were doing they were hauling daffodil bulbs out and <laughs> chucking them all over the place the the neighbor who came back was in <laughs> tears it was so terrible what were they doing was it vandalism was it play yeah. was it uh, you know it looked like vandalism <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd call that vandalism. <laughs> I think a lot of, a lot of, <laughs> well, they, I mean, the cock cockatoos are highly intelligent. They, they're playful. Um, in a traditional diet, they have to spend a lot more time looking for food than they do now. So they've got a lot of leftover time and energy. So yeah, they'll fool around and <laughs> hang out, do stuff. But yeah, I mean, the problems that they're causing, chewing bits of wood, I mean, some of it's bill sharpening, although what you're describing isn't doing that. But that, I mean, I talk, I talk about this in my book about, um, you know, conservationists doing revegetation work and the cockatoos come and pull all the plants out. Yeah. You know, there are earnest human beings trying to create more habitat for cockatoos and they're ruining it. <laughs> So it is play. They Naughty. Have got. Arrest them immediately <laughs> for vandalism. You I need a very large police force in Sydney, I tell you. <laughs> have, have you noticed the way with the lemons, for example, they will strip the lemon, so they'll just take the outside of the lemon. They won't bother with the actual... No, that's the possums. Uh, it's <coughs> the, um, no, this particular attack, and I call it an attack, they just pulled everything off and threw it away. They didn't right. even appear to be eating any of the things that they like. Shocking. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, the two, two things we're doing that mean that we are in store for more cockatoo problems. One is feeding them. One is having them in captivity and then they sometimes escape mm. and get away. So you have birds that are encouraged to come near human infrastructure by the people putting out the food plus birds that are incredibly used to people because they've been kept in cages that combination means that we are breeding breeding these problems for ourselves um, i'm wondering about the insects that get uncovered when the miners eat the lerp sugar does that not encourage uh, a lot of insect eating birds or are the miners, have the miners chased them away anyway? Yeah, they've chased them away. So what I suppose, what I should have said was that that, that tinkling call, it's really saying, get out, stay mm. away, keep out, or, you know, F off, if you wanted to be really blunt about it. <laughs> Fly off, he yeah. means. <laughs> <laughs> I wish everyone said that so nicely. <laughs> Um, if birds evolved from dinosaurs, do you think that dinosaurs had songs? Oh, mm. what a lovely question. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you look at the birds that are on the lowest part of the, the bird phylogenetic tree, you're looking at ostriches, emus, cassowaries, rears. So their vocalisations are not, not song-like. Then the, the next branch you get, oh, these are the living birds, are ducks, geese, uh, chickens, pheasants, quail. You, you get once you start getting to the songs, you're fair way up the phylogenetic tree. So you'd be inclined to say that I'm sure there would have been dinosaurs with vocalization. I think some of the skeletal structures they're saying that they are for vocalizations, but they were probably much much more simple sounds because uh, the, the the songs really are just in that one branch within the songbirds, which... But when you watch a David Attenborough program with a pterodactyl in it, it's always got a sound. It does make a sound. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So sound was, sound was there yes. all along. That's right. Wouldn't yeah. be a song, but there's yeah. something. Yeah, so it depends on whether you mean song or sound. But, but in terms of song where you've got com complex vocal structure, you don't, you don't get that in the earliest or the oldest bird group. So you, on, on using that as the, the logic, you probably didn't you assume that you didn't get it in dinosaurs. Hi, Tim. Thanks so much for talking today. Um, I found it really interesting what you said about the lyrebirds uh, creating a fire break. And I know that um, back burning can be a real problem in terms of um, the woodland birds, for instance. They're suffering because of this. So perhaps we could, do you think we could adopt this new strategy of you know, protecting ourselves from fire? Well, the trouble is that in the, in the 1930s, it was thought that lyrebirds were dying out on the mainland because of foxes, so they were moved to Tasmania. If you look at the World Heritage 
uh, Southwest Tasmania World Heritage website, they list lyrebirds as one of the main threats to the integrity of the World Heritage Area because they are, the amount of mineral soil they scratch up, it causes soil erosion. I mean, you get gullies eroding up from lyrebirds moving too much dirt. So, um, and there's, there's a rare orchid that's being dug up. They've, they've actually had to put a fence, a lyrebird lyre fence around this endangered orchid. So we actually have a, this, what you're suggesting has been done for a different reason and it was a really bad idea and so um, yeah I, d I don't suggest moving live birds around for that reason. Um, I have a question, thank you very much for your interesting insights. I have a question that relates to um, maintenance of habitat um, versus restoration of habitat. I know for example that about 20 odd years ago, David Payton was very mm. strong on, in terms of maintaining the, wood, the small woodland and grassland birds, um, maintenance of habitat rather than any attempts at revegetation because it tended to be counterproductive. But now I think he thinks that the situation is so dire that large scale restoration is necessary. And I also note that um, people like um, Hugh Possingham have um, been documenting the winners and losers, not just in cities, mm. but in bushland areas outside cities. So I wondered whether you had some comments, some lovely insights about how we deal with that. Well, probably not very lovely. I mean, I'm, you know, very, <laughs> very much think that, you know, the, yes. the, the rem, like tr trying to turn paddocks of exotic pasture into good habitat i mean that's you know really not not a very viable thing to do so that it is about you know finding finding places where you've got intact ground cover and and saving those places and restoring those that um yeah i, I don't have anything yeah. really clever to say i mean i'm mean, aware of david's work in the was it monato that new city where all the, the plantings were put in and you know he's I've talked to him. He's a, he's a really good guy. I put a lot of faith in what he says. I mean, it's, it's very interesting that a lot of the um, birds that are very rare or you know, virtually extinct in South Australia are still doing quite well in southern Queensland, where I am. So, you know, I've, bush curlews are right in the middle of Brisbane, whereas I think here they're only still surviving on Kangaroo Island. Um, so, yeah, you need your local knowledge when it comes to re revegetation. Mm. One final very quick question, please. Oh. Well, I'm almost reluctant to ask it because I wanted to end on a positive note. For I'll what try has been a very positive um, speech, but um, I live south of Adelaide where people are virtually living in the bottom of a cocky's cage where the gorillas are nesting on trees and they've decided to live there all the year round. Um, and it's become such a problem in one of the local schools that the schools applied for You're talking permission about to Wollonga. get rid of them. Yeah. I was there yesterday. <laughs> right. So I'm just wondering what your uh, ideas of that dealing with that problem are. <laughs> <laughs> I think the... I mean, I, in Queensland, we don't have the Corella problems. We have the f how to get flying foxes out of towns is the analogous problem. And I've, I've advised, you know, as an environmental consultant, advised councils and... Yeah, you, know, you you look inside your toolkit. What can you do? There's just almost nothing there. I, yeah, I think it's really, really tough. Really, really tough. And that, yeah, we we really need to think back at the early stages. You know, like, don't don't keep cockatoos. You mm -hmm. know, because they're going to some of them. It's not usually good for them. I mean, there's really strong ethical grounds not to keep them, but some of them are going to get out. But yeah, some of these Corella problems are. Corellas that have been captive because you've now got long billed corellas in Queensland, it's huge distances from their native range. They haven't flown there. These are escape birds that have come out. But yeah, and I think, I think that these, you know, we we tend to let engineers try and solve our problems. But when engineers deal with biological problems, uh, that that whole kind of framework of thinking doesn't work. And you think, okay, well, what's the biological alternative? And to come up with solutions, it's really tough, you know, like cure the common cold, cure these diseases that biological problems are sticky problems that can be really intractable. And so, you know, we have, and I think part of what we have to do is accept that it, this isn't just our landscape. We, there are other species that have got their own agendas and that it's very naive to think that you can just run it the human way, that you, you have to make compromises because you have no choice. 
Well, I don't know that that was a positive to note, note to end on, but I have to say, what else can I say but that the hour has flown by. Uh, please, will you join me in thanking Tim Lowe? <laughs> Thank you, Caroline.